This well, conference will Asha now be and recorded. All my dear brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's always wonderful to be able to be together and meet together to share the bread and wine and the remembrance of our Lord Jesus. Um, even if that is, is virtually as well for our brothers and sisters who are meeting with us by go to meeting. Um, okay. <clears throat> So I, uh, um, like I think most of, uh, um, well, all of you, I'm sure, uh, were impre quite impressed uh, last Sunday by Brother Ben's exhortation, exhorting us about devotion and obligation. And it got me thinking on a bit of a tangent um, about commitment. And, uh, of course, we're here to, to gather today to, to share the remembrance or the symbols of our Lord's commitment to his Father in heaven. So just as uh, an exercise to begin with, what springs to your mind when you hear the word commitment? It's an opportunity for audience participation. Marriage? Just recently happened, isn't it? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Children? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, something you're obliged to do. Yep. Education. Employment. Gym. Gym. Yeah, that's a serious commitment right there. Life in Christ. That's absolutely. That's right. So there's lots of things that we, you know, that we, uh, when we think about commitment, there's lots of things. Of course, some of those are commitment. Some of those commitments are much more significant commitments. Uh, than others. And so just like to explore uh, together with you some things about commitment and, and also some things that we see, some examples of commitment we see in our readings, uh, readings today. Um, in particular, as Brother Steve uh, pointed out, our, the commitment we've made to our life, our life in Christ. Now, we're all, all of us are uh, you know, go up and down in our the strength of our commitment. At least I imagine that that's that's the case. I know that's what happens for me. But just if we just cast our mind back for a moment and we just explore together um, what the Apostle Paul says in Romans six. So I've been spending a little bit of time in Romans six, uh, um, and at the end of Romans six, the last half of Romans chapter six, the Apostle Paul talks about how naturally we are in service to King Sin. And King Sin is pays wages of death. Who wants to serve King Sin? Oh, it's great. Like nobody. So it's super. The problem is, of course, if, if King Sin was genuinely like an external king who we served and paid wages of death, we would say this is just terrible. We're not onto it. We're not in on that. The answer is no. But the problem is, of course, what we know is that king sin is actually us, ourself, and the carnal mind. And that's a whole lot more trickier to turn down because naturally that's where we're at. But the good thing is that in Romans chapter 6, the apostle Paul tells us there's another king. There's the king of righteousness, king righteousness, and that king is God. And he doesn't pay wages. I didn't pay wages at all. But he gives a free gift a free gift of eternal life. So it's Romans 6, verse 23. Now, now, we know that this is the case. The problem is, we're over here on the left. Yep, we're over here on the left, my right, your left. How do we get over to the other side? We need to, we need to change of kings. And the Apostle Paul, earlier in the ch that chapter in Romans 6, says that that happens by baptism. Like we go from... King sin to king righteousness, which is God, and we do that by baptism. So that's the whole thing in Roman in the start of Romans chapter six is that we make it we make a commitment to a new king. We get rid of the old one, we make a commitment to a new king. And we do that by baptism. Now <clears throat> the reward of this from this king is obviously just far, far better. Than the, uh, than the service of King Sin. But of course, we know that 
turns out it's not as simple as that. So earlier in the chapter, I'm just going to whiz through this because I think you all probably are pretty familiar with how baptism works. But it's like this. Baptism is a symbolic connection and association with what Jesus... So we read in Matthew, in Mark 15 about the death and crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. And tomorrow in Mark 16, we're going to read about his resurrection. And the Apostle Paul talks about in Romans chapter 6 how we associate ourselves, we identify, we connect symbolically with Jesus' death and resurrection. Because this is how we exit from king's sin and we transfer our commitment to the king of righteousness as God. And we go from like our current state, we weighed weighed down by our sins and problems and our old self. And we symbolically, like Christ, uh, we're baptised, we're baptised into his death. We go down into the water. Bath under here. I didn't actually realise, sorry, it's just a digression. I didn't actually realise how deep the bath is under here. Like, it's seriously deep. Anyway. Um, but it's like you're really going down. So we're baptised into his death. So this is the crucifixion part. With him, we're baptised with him into his death. And we're buried with him by baptism into his death. We symbolically do that. Of course, God doesn't ask us to literally... Do that, however deep the bath is here. But then we symbolically come out of the water and we're raised up from the dead, just like Jesus, and we walk in newness of life. And God forgives us, like forgiven, freed from the burden of guilt with new hope in our hearts. Like that is amazing. That is excellent. And that is how we transition from king sin to king righteousness. Now, you already knew that. But that's, that's it. And we come out and we have died to king sin, that is self, and now we're a new life, a new life to king righteousness committed to God and we're living the Christ life. Now, of course, did you see the hook? So, like, it's pretty amazing, like, what God has done what the Father who created all things has done. So he's made a way for us to leave behind sin and death. Like there's no escaping. Like our situation is hopeless. But God makes a way. And we can change allegiance. And this is what Jesus talks about in Matthew 16 when he talks about the good news. So you've got to go, he says to the disciples, you go out into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptised should be saved. He that believes not should be damned. This is the good news. The gospel we know is the good news. This is the good news that we that we that they were to preach and we are to preach as well. And it's amazing because not only does God forgive our sins and lift the burden of guilt from our from our shoulders, which is worth it, but so it's a gift of God. We don't earn it, of course. No wage is involved. The forgiveness, lifting the burden of guilt of sin. But God also gives us a personal relationship with the creator of all things and his son, Jesus. A personal relationship, right? Incredible. He gives us a meaning and purpose to our lives that outside of him we don't really have. He gives us a spiritual family, all of us here, you know what families are like. Anyway, God gives us a spiritual family to support us. That's what we're supposed to do. To support us in our journey, in, in this life. And God gives us hope and confidence for the future. That is the kingdom of God and beyond the gift. And he's giving us the gift of eternal life. But I don't know whether you noticed the hook Because God's giving an amazing gift. But if we go back here and we see that, so when we symbolically died and symbolically were buried and symbolically rose from the dead and we associated ourselves with Jesus, God says 
that's good because now you need to live the new life in Christ, the resurrected life. Because you're dead. The old self is dead. You need to live the new life. That's the commitment we're making. And by the way, when God says, I want you to commit, God says, I'm giving you amazing things, but you've got to commit everything. When God asks for commitment from us, God asks the full thing. God is not asking for monthly repayments at a set interest rate and mortgage. I mean, that's a difficult, that can be challenging because, you know, like when the rates are going up, it gets trickier. But God's asking for a different commitment. God wants, God's giving us more, but God asks our full commitment. And this commit this commitment that we make to God is made in blood. It's made in the blood of his son. And for this commitment, there's no exit clauses. There's no annulling. God offers us all these things. But God asks a lot as well. And so we should go in eyes open. We should not close our eyes. We need to see clear-eyed what God asks of us. Are we willing to are we willing to make that commitment? Because, like, you know, the nice diagram with the death and resurrection bit, like the doctrinal bit, you know, to understand the mechanics of all that, like that's actually super easy to teach. Like, like that's not a difficult thing. It's not actually even a difficult thing to agree with. The difficult thing for all of us, which is where the commitment bit comes in, it's the, it, it's the living the Christ life part. Like that's the difficult part of the commitment. Or is it like just for me? Well, that's difficult. Okay, all right, that's good. So I'm worried, worried there. So, but we've got like so as a this is a blessing. We like Brother Roberts wrote um, probably 150 years ago or so, or maybe not quite that far, maybe 100 years ago. It kind of seems the same. He wrote that little booklet called the Commandments of Christ, which is a distillation of the commandments, of the teaching of Christ for our way of life from the words of our Lord and the words of the apostles. And this is just this is fabulous because this gets this gives us guidance for how it is that we should we are to live the Christ life, the new life in Christ. Like this is the guide, this is great guidance. And we can read we should read that every day to find Christ's teaching and meaning what that means in our life and to, because that challenges us and it challenges our commitment. And we know, going back to commitment, that experience tells us that we should be wary about commitments because commitments tend to be easy to make but then when we're called to fulfil them, that can be just that much trickier. You know, mentioned mortgages. Yeah, easy to make, like when interest rates are 2%, borrow everything, but interest rates are whatever they are now, 6 7%. Not so easy. You know, the gym, easy to, easy to, like a nice idea, go to the, commit to the gym, but like at five in the morning when it's freezing cold and wet. You know, like, so we know that. That's our experience, you know, and, you know, for all the other things. It's our experience. And it's easy to make commitments which... We don't always, because we don't always know what's coming up in our future. You know, stuff happens. Things we didn't expect to see. The events we didn't expect to happen. Unforeseen circumstances. And it's the when those unforeseen circumstances and crises come in our lives, that that is the true test of our commitment. Now, of course, the commitment we're talking about is the, you know, it's true of all commitments, by the way, but the commitment we're talking about is the commitment of the life in Christ. We're, that's the commitment we're talking about, the, the new life, in, the Christ life. It's only when the crises and the difficulties in our life come that we find out 
the worth and the value of our commitment. And by the way, God has promised us that he will test our commitment. So we shouldn't be surprised when the crises and the challenges come. You know, the apostles write about that. So anyway, with the few moments that I have left, because Naomi told me that I had like a solid hour on this piece of paper, and I assured her that that was just not true at all. Like not true. So at least 60 minutes. In, um, in our reading in Mark 14, 15 and 16, so yesterday's reading, today's reading and tomorrow's reading, in fact, actually in the King's reading as well, um, there's, I'd like us just to look at seven examples of commitment. And I, I think, you know, one, you know, have a look at these seven examples of commitment and, and think about where, how these things might connect with you. And I'll just take them in order as they, as they come. So obviously we've got uh, Jesus. So we know Jesus, we know about Jesus' commitment, unfailing. Full commitment the whole way. But we know that in Mark 14, Jesus had that time in the garden, that time of struggle to find the determination to see his commitment through, to see through his devotion to his Father, to bring salvation to all mankind. He had that struggle in the garden, but with prayer and strength from God, he came through, to see, see that through, committed fully right to the very end. Well, we know about Jesus. If we have a look in Mark 14, we meet Judas. So Judas had made a commitment. He committed to Jesus. Remember? Back at the beginning of the ministry, three and a half years earlier, Judas had committed, like all the 12 disciples and many others, he had committed to Jesus, to following Jesus, to being his disciple. He'd made that commitment. But when we meet him in Mark 14, we find that in verse 10, he went to the chief priests to betray his Lord. Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, went to the chief priest to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad. This is verse 11 of Mark 14. And the group promised to give him money. And he saw how he might betray him. And we come to verse 43, and it says, Immediately, while he yet spoke, while Jesus yet spoke, Judas, one of the twelve, with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the high priests and elders. And he that betrayed him had given them a token, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, the same as he bind him fast and take him away. And as soon as he was come, he goes straight to Jesus to him and said, Master, Master, and kissed him. What happened to Judas's commitment? The commitment he'd made in the sunny days on Galilee three and a half years earlier, his commitment to money was, was more than that. That was the strength of his commitment. Well, what about the other eleven? Because you remember, like they committed to Jesus around the same time as Judas. Well, verse 50 tells us that they all forsook him and fled. To Mark 14, verse 50. All the other 11 made, made a commitment. Well, Luke, Mark doesn't tell us, but we know from the other Gospels that they had all previously sworn that they would be loyal to Jesus. So not just on the shores of Galilee, but like within hours. They'd sworn their loyalty to Jesus. They ran away. When the crisis came, to test their commitment to their Lord, they ran away. There was another disciple in verse 51, a certain young man, who's probably Mark, the writer of the gospel, but we don't know, a certain young man. And it seems that he came to warn Jesus about the soldiers. Maybe they'd been to their house beforehand with the upper room. And he was a disciple. And he'd thrown on what he could and he ran out to warn Jesus. But they took hold of him and he left the linen cloth and ran away. He ran away too. He was committed to Jesus and went to warn him because he loved, loved his Lord. 
But when it came to maybe being, being arrested, not this time. Now, we, of course, know that Mark is going, John Mark is going to have several attempts at you know, really becoming committed. He's going to try and be committed with Paul and Barnabas, and that doesn't work out in the first journey. So, you know, it's going to take time for his commitment to come through, but he makes it. Well, then there's Peter. Oh, Peter's obviously comes up earlier, but there's Peter. So Peter in Mark 14, verse 29, you know, when Jesus says, everyone, you're all going to run away, like everyone's going to be offended. Well, Peter says, all of those will be offended. Like, those guys, that lot, they'll be offended, but not me. I'm different. My commitment is a cut above theirs. Verse 29, Peter said to him, though all shall be offended, yet will not I. And Jesus says to him, tells him straight, truly I say to you that this day, even this night before the cock crow thrice, you will deny me thrice, you will deny me thrice. And he spake them all vehemently. If I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. And likewise said they all. Peter swears his undying loyalty, his commitment to Jesus to the end. Well, a few hours later, in verse 37, when they're in the garden, when the crisis is coming on the Lord, when he's struggling, he needs his close friends, Peter, James and John, to stay awake with him. And they fall asleep. They let their Lord down. What happened? And Jesus comes to Peter and says, he finds, so there's three of them, Peter, James and John, but when Jesus comes to verse 37, he says to Peter, he finds them sleeping and says to Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldst thou not watch with me one hour? You, Peter, who just swore loyalty to death, asleep. Well, Peter struggled on and fell asleep again. And Jesus says to them again, like, time to get up. There's things to do. Well, Peter, verse 50, he's one of the 11 who runs away. So when the crisis, we know from Luke that he, or John that he takes out his sword and does those things. Mark doesn't record it, but he does those things. But in the end, he runs away like the others. But Peter can't stay away. He comes back. He comes back to see the end. So verse, um, verse 54, it says, Peter followed him afar off, even to the palace of the high priest, and he sat with his servants and warmed himself by the fire. He can't stay away. And we know, of course, from verse 66 to, 60 to 72 of chapter 14, that Peter is at this moment in life, in, his, in the crisis of his faith, is going to deny three times that he ever knew his Lord. Hours after he swore that he would die for his Lord. When Peter made his commitment to his Lord, he didn't imagine that any of these things would happen. He didn't believe it. And when the crisis came and events overtook him, his commitment crumbled. But we know, of course, that that wasn't the end of the story for Peter or for the other disciples. They found forgiveness and they found commitment. They found a way to commit to their Lord. But it's not just Peter's, not the last of this story. There's Joseph and Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus is mentioned in John, but Joseph is mentioned here at the end of Mark 15. Joseph of Arimathea. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. In the other Gospels, it tells us that he was not consenting to the deed. 
So he was one who'd stood up in the Sanhedrin at the trials of Jesus and opposed what was done. And John tells us and Luke, they tell us that previously he'd been his disciple in secret. Up until this, this crisis, Joseph and Nicodemus hadn't had the courage of their commitment to commit publicly to Jesus. But at this time of crisis, Joseph and Nicodemus had found their courage and stood up publicly and committed themselves to Jesus at the cost of everything in society. Before they'd been secret disciples, afraid of what other people would think. But now they're open. At the end, when Jesus is dying, they found their courage. They found their commitment, their willingness to come out in the open and be committed to Jesus at the cost of everything. And it did cost them everything. And finally, we have Mary, Mary and Salome and the other women who followed Jesus from Galilee. And their commitment was unwavering. They were committed to the Lord the whole way through, even to the very end, committed even to do the last rites for his burial, not appreciating that he would rise from the dead. So here we have, just from Mark, this story in Mark, seven examples, groups of people, individuals or groups of people, and their commitment, or not, how their commitment crumbled, or how they found their commitment to Jesus at this moment of crisis. So I think in this story, I hope, that we can all find, hopefully more than one, that we can connect with. Because, of course, we know that our commitment goes up and down. The strength of our commitment waxes and wanes when the crises of our lives come upon us and God tries us and tests our commitment. And that's why it's important that we come here, we come here today and we share bread and wine because we remember today, we remember, we take bread and wine and we remember this, our Lord's commitment. We share our remembrance of his commitment, how he was committed. And of course that reminds us of how we are committed to him. not just committed to him, how we are committed to living the new Christ life and all the challenges that that brings. So in the spectrum of, you know, Mark 14 to 16, we need to have a think for ourselves. Where is our commitment to the new Christ life? Waxing and waning. But I think like these... We haven't got to that yet. But these seven examples in Marx, I think, should give us courage that whatever our situation, wherever we're at, we can find courage and encouragement from their examples to find our commitment to our Lord. To know that God is not finished with us even if our commitment is failing. There's still opportunity. The Lord was not finished with Peter or the other 11. These people, are, these people the, the women... The disciples, Joseph, Nicodemus, these are examples for us. 
who have committed to our Lord. We have their examples to give us courage. And we have commandments of Christ to help us and prompt us to think about the commitment we've made, about what it means to live the new life in Christ, to point us towards the principles of of Christ's living. So, brothers and sisters, as we share the bread and wine together today, and we think about our Lord's unfailing commitment, about the commitment that we've made to him, but let's remember that God has called us to be part of his family, to unburden us, us of sin, to give us a family, a spiritual family today, to give us meaning and purpose in life now, to give us hope in our hearts for a marvellous future and hope for life eternal. This is an amazing gift that our Heavenly Father has given to us and that we have an opportunity to remember his son who made it all possible. Andrew has um, reminded us about yeah our commitments to Jesus and to God and the gift of 